Listening to the GHT Overland Podcast. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. This is where you get the greatest interviews and insights from overland travelers around the globe, learning from their stories and experiences as we interview overlanders from places like Australia, Africa, the Americas. Portugal, and today we're back in Patagonia. You are about to learn the basics to the advanced in overlanding, so buckle up and get ready for more adventure. I'm Chris. And I'm Lisa. This is part two with Ben and Rachel. Last week, we learned about doggy passports, car insurance for the overlander, and other cool things from Ben and Rachel. This week, you'll want to buckle up as we discuss traveling with a partner 24-7 and the inherent challenges that brings to a relationship. I can only imagine. We will also cover border crossing tips with a dog. And of course, we ask those finance questions so you can learn how to prepare and sustain an overland trip like Ben and Rachel. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. Are you ready to get into it? I am. Without boxing gloves? Yes, I will put my boxing gloves aside. Very good. Tell us about that number one biggest challenge you've had to overcome on the road. Think being in close proximity 24 7 with your partner, it's tough. Uh, it's something you don't see a lot of talk of in blogs and on Instagram, but I think everyone deals with learning how to make your relationship work on the road. It's different than when you're at home and you go to work and then you come home after this eight, 10 hour day apart from each other. It's different than when you've spent 24 hours together and you go through the stressful situations together. You are together through bad moods and <laughs> and good moods too. I think that's been our biggest challenge is learning how to make things work. Yeah, I, I agree. And there were quite a few people or couples we met and then later a few months later we met them again and then there was only one left <laughs> i was like uh where yeah. where's your partner <laughs> I, I mean that's not it, super common but, but it happens yeah. more often than you think i guess so it is it is it is different it's a really different life and you are especially in a small car or if you have a van or something like that you don't have your as a, your own personal space and you're together, as you said, like 24 by seven. So that's, that I guess is the biggest challenge. And I would say we ask this question on every interview we do. And I would say probably half close to half. That's the answer. So any tips that you've got in managing that relationship when you can't really get away from each other, is there anything that you guys have found that you you do to create that separation and kind of do things um, individually? One thing towards the beginning that we did is we wrote a set of like rules for the car. And we haven't gone back and looked at them, but they set a few boundaries that help relieve some of the stress. Like it set expectations. Um one of the things we decided, whoever cooks doesn't have to clean up dinner. And it, it sounds really minor, but for me, it was driving me crazy that I'd sure. spend an hour or two making a really nice dinner. And then I felt like I had to fight over who was going to clean. And Ben didn't realize before that to him, it was no big deal. Yeah, clean up, whatever. And I was like, no, this is a big deal to me that you appreciate my meal. And then I want you to show it by cleaning it. 
(laughs) (laughs) So there's a lot of little things like that. It didn't solve all the problems. Um, For me, going out for a run, if I can, or getting some exercise on my own, that helps a lot. That helps me de-stress and just do my own thing. Um, Or like if one one person just watches their whatever Netflix show they like and kind of has basically the earphones in and is focused on just watching something and you know like having this separation by by watching i don't know netflix and i would do some car maintenance like have there's like have some duties everybody has like a little bit of kind of like pretty responsibility yeah, yeah responsibilities uh like i do mo- like i do all of the car maintenance and Rachel usually cooks, uh, which sounds really stereotypical <laughs> if you think about it. But so it's just how how else our interests. So I'm yeah. envisioning a stress reliever. I haven't told Chris this though. Oh boy! Yet, <laughs> but it brings up a good point. Um, I'd like to carry a pair of boxing gloves. Oh jeez! <laughs> <laughs> so we could you know keep it light and just duke it out, and you know a good quick boxing session just relieves a lot of stress (laughs) okay yeah (laughs) jeez aggressive but i mean something like that is always i think it's it's actually a a good idea right if you can just uh get something out i guess by going running or having a boxing session or or i know (laughs) surfing or whatever you can do in in the area you are it's it's usually physical activity helps often Mm -hmm. uh getting rid of stress awesome so once we're done with that (laughs) border crossings (laughs) what tips do you have in preparing for them what is your process as you go through a border crossing um I think it's similar to with the dog. Have your have your things together. Like keep all the papers you get at the border. Keep them until you leave the country. You've left the country. Uh, it, if it even is such a small little slip of paper, you think you'll never need it. You probably will need it when you leave. Uh, so that's that's one of the things. Just have your have all your documents for the car, for the dog, for yourself together in one secure place that can't be uh, probably in a safe or something in your car. If if somebody breaks into your car, your passports and all that stuff is still you still have that. I think that's one of the main things. And and afterwards, the border crossings are actually they need time, they need nerves, but they're usually quite simple and everything is documented in iOverlander in the border crossing sections or in, or at wiki overland. Uh, so. Yeah, it depends on the border, but generally you have to first step, you check out of the previous country, you go through migration, the um, aduana, the customs for the car, and then you go to the other side and you do migration again for entry. You do the customs for the car. And then if you have a dog, you'll do whatever paperwork is necessary for the dog with the agriculture office. Um, there's a lot of complaints about coming into Chile. The Chile-Argentina crossings, they're pretty strict about bringing in food items. But for us, it's been the most organized and professional border crossings because they're actually trained and know what they're doing. And there's a clear uh, order to do things. Central Mm -hmm. America is a little chaotic. Um, We, the worst border crossing for us was coming into Honduras. We're first leaving El Salvador. There was a power outage. So getting copies, we couldn't. And Ben had to run around forever. Walk to the, yeah, I had to walk to Honduras to get copies for the papers in, <laughs> that I needed to go out of El Salvador. <laughs> and their, their computer systems are down. But you just have to accept that it's going to take time. You plan like the whole day in Central America around a border crossing. Where down in South America, it feels like a breeze. Yeah. It's... The longest one's been two hours. And then Honduras took us five, I think. Yeah. Maybe five or six. Because... I couldn't find the agriculture office. I thought, no big deal. They never seem to care about the dog anyways. And then once we left, 
the border area. We got stopped. They asked for the paperwork. And then the police took me back with Mitzi to the agriculture <laughs> office oh, to go. So I got to ride in the cop car in Central America. That's fun. <laughs> um, well, at least I showed you where it was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was a little confused what was going on at the moment. Like, get in the cop car, bring the dog. What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, I would but probably be a little that, nervous. Like, ben? Where, ben? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, okay, don't leave me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess border crossings in Central America, you never know, and it depends on the day and who's working, if they care and what they want. It could have been the next day we showed up and they looked at the dog and said, yeah, nice dog. Okay, go. You just never know. Yeah, but generally I think... I was really nervous, like crossing into me- into Mexico. Like I, I we didn't back then we didn't speak any Spanish basically, um, so that was a that was a problem. And then B, you hear all these stories while you travel in the United States, how dangerous Mexico is. And uh, even though, you know, these are just stories, and you can probably half of them. I mean, most of them are probably not true, but still, it kind of it settles in after a while. Right? You, you you have that in your mind, but once you're there, you realize the people are usually want to help you. They are happy to have to receive guests in their country. They are proud to be Mexican or, or or from El Salvador or Guatemala or whatever, and they want you to have a good time there. And if you try. If you be nice, if you're patient, if you try to speak Spanish, uh, for us at least, things always worked out very easily and very good. Any specific safety planning you do or tips you can provide our listeners on safety and security? I think the biggest topic for us is like that nobody breaks into our car when we're gone. Um so for one, we have a, a hidden spot in the car where we have all our documents and, and money and stuff like that. So if somebody breaks into the car, at least, you know, the basics, we still have them. We still have some money. We still have our passports. Uh, and then obviously we, we try to park whenever possible on, on guarded parkings. And uh, we also put up like the shades, the... The, the sun shades on the car so people can't see in. Mm. Um, that's like one one thing. For wild camping, we prefer to camp wild in remote areas um, where there basically just nobody nobody's around. So um, I think that that gives you at least uh, it it makes you feel safe. And otherwise, and I mean, Iowa Lander is a good source of places uh, that are safe or they're all also not safe. For example, Bariloche, which had like a ton of car break-ins and even people being robbed while wild camping in the area. So in these areas, we just don't wild camp. We just go to campgrounds. Like if you don't feel safe at a place, if you think something's shady... Then don't stay. You're not going to yeah. enjoy it if you don't feel safe. It was the same in Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. I think our first night in Costa Rica, we met a couple that had their car broken into. And then a couple days later, a friend had his car broken into there. Um, So we were very cautious there about where to sleep on the beach and areas to only stay in secure camping. Let's dive deeper on finances. One of the most common questions asked is how can you afford to do what you're doing? Or I'm sure you've gotten the famous, you must have won the lottery or be rich. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Obviously, the real question is, how can others do what you're doing? So if you would, give us your best insights on financing and budgeting on an overland trip like yours. I was planning, or I had the idea of doing this for many, many years. So I worked onto that by saving money, by kind of planning, well, not yeah, kind of steering my career into the right direction that allows me to save enough money to do something like that. Um, and we are not, uh, I wouldn't say we are rich, but we also not poor. So we can have, we can have a good lifestyle. We can go into a campground. We can like today we can rent an Airbnb because the weather is just so bad. We don't want to spend the the day in the, in the car and, and wait for the weather to get better. 
Uh, so I think it's really an individual thing, like do focus on your on your goal, going to travel, uh, reduce your your costs by having a smaller apartment, by not going partying every weekend, <laughs> by not eating out every day, like just to really reduce your, your cost of living as far as you can and as you feel comfortable, and then you just have to... I know, bite the bullet and work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, definitely a luxury that we can afford to take, basically quit our jobs for a couple of years and come out. And we both had a full career, like a 10-year career. Mm -hmm. We've both put money away and not lived extravagantly. And we haven't really budgeted. Ben was sort of budgeting before I joined, but <laughs> I think... <laughs> We haven't had any big cost trips. Like we didn't go to the Galapagos or Antarctica. Um, but for that, we have a flexibility with our day to day. Um, like Ben said, we can we can have an Airbnb. And when we were in Colombia, two friends came to visit us over Thanksgiving, and we went out for a completely extravagant meal in Bogota. Um, <laughs> If it's something that would have cost four times that back home, but it was a super fancy meal, an amazing experience, mm. and that it's nice that we have the flexibility to do that. Living in in Switzerland obviously is a is a, is a plus if you want to go travel um, because obviously the the standard of living is very high, um, salaries are are quite high, and the Swiss franc is is a strong currency. So with the money I earn in Switzerland, you can live in Latin America for a much longer time. And traveling in a car doesn't cost that much. Your, your biggest expense is usually uh, gas or, or diesel. And the, the slower you travel, the less you need that. So you can actually, it's, it's kind of like a paradox. The, the, the longer you go, the less money you need. Because the most expensive thing is, is getting around. And if you just stay at the place for a while, you, you don't have that cost. All you need is, is food. And food is pretty cheap. In the initial time of getting ready to do this, is there a percentage at all that you set aside? Um, for me, no. I just set aside everything I didn't need. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was, um, yeah, like I just the way as much as I could. And if you guys come up with like a daily budget? Initially we did. It was like 40 bucks a day, um, which is really just for an, like including more or less everything. But, and I also tracked this for the first five or six months. And I actually managed to keep it below that in the States uh, as well. But over time, we just stopped tracking the expenses because I don't know, you get lazy. I don't know. <laughs> so we don't really have that. And now we're in the last stretch. Um, we'll be home by the end of the year. And we looked at our finances and we've done, we haven't spent too much money. So now I'd say we kind of loosen the purse strings. We're allowing ourselves a little more luxury than mm. at the beginning. That's great. So thank you for going through those details. That's super helpful. Let's go into navigation and communication really quick. Um, any tips you've got on staying connected to the outside world from cell phones, um, SIM cards? How do you do that? Uh, in the beginning, I I didn't buy uh, local SIM cards, which I was traveling alone and I actually really liked I was completely disconnected from the world. But I didn't like that because I was still in Switzerland and he would just appear for days at an end. Uh, so, but after a while, we just started to buy SIM cards, local SIM cards, and just for data, basically. So we communicate with our family and friends back home with WhatsApp. Uh, when we're in an Airbnb or at a, at a hostel or campground with fast internet, we do Skype calls for for emergency, we, we do have a Garmin InReach uh, device, which we also take hiking. Um, just It's really it's just an emergency device. We don't track the route. We just use it to send SMS or, or use. Well, we haven't have never used the SOS function, luckily. That's um, good. But we were, 
we were glad to have the SMS function when we were in Oaxaca uh, after the earthquake. And we obviously we were fine, so we could let our families know that nothing happened to us. Yeah, we were in a valley that had zero reception, no reception anywhere near. And then we felt an earthquake and we didn't know if it was something big. So we sent a message to our family and my dad responded and he let everybody know we weren't near the epicenter. Oh, that's super Ooh. helpful. Yep. An earthquake. Yeah. Ben had his first couple <laughs> earthquakes on this trip. <laughs> What'd you think, Ben? Uh, yes, it's strange. We don't, I mean, there are earthquakes in Switzerland, but they're super rare and they're tiny. Tiny. <laughs> they're like two, mm. you know, something like that. You don't, you rarely feel them. Uh, so yeah, that was an experience and we had a few, like yesterday there was a tiny one here too. Uh, I, I don't believe it. I was in the shower. I didn't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, yeah, there is, there is much more obviously along the, especially in Chile and, and along the coast there. Yeah. The second one, we were, we were camping in the desert of Northern Chile and we had just gotten food poisoning. So we were not having a good night. <laughs> And then the car starts shaking like somebody's moving it. And we're like, what is going on? This is, no, how can this be? <laughs> What's going to happen next? <laughs> That's great. So let's go through some onboard necessities real quick. How much fuel can you carry? How far does that take you? And any tips you've got on calculating your fuel needs? Um, fuel consumption is actually one of the things I track since the start of the, of the trip. So I, I have a pretty good idea um how far we can go so we can carry about uh let me do the math 120 liters of diesel which takes us depending on the road conditions between 800 to uh even 100 uh kilometers it really depends on on what kind of roads you drive how much wind there is and, and so on sure but it gives gives us a really good uh Really good range. range. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, an additional 20 liter cherry can, but we have never used that one. So we could have even more. Do you usually keep it full or is it always empty? It's always empty. Okay. Uh, we bought it for Bolivia, but we skipped Bolivia. Uh, we're going to head back there actually soonish <laughs> in the next weeks, months. Uh, and there we bought it because it's kind of, it's difficult to get, it can be difficult to get gas. If you come with just the cherry can, it's much easier because they don't have to do paperwork and you probably get the local rate and so on. So that's the main reason we have that. Okay. And how much water do you carry and any tips you have for filtration? So we have an uh, onboard 35 liter tank with water. Uh, it has a water pump and it has a filtration system. Uh, attached to it uh, like with a pre-filter and then the main filter and a uv filter so we basically fill up water whenever we see a water tap that has clear water uh, we've never had any problems with the water we drank uh, but, we'll see, but we also have addition in addition to that is an is a lifesaver cherry, cherry can I don't know, have you heard of that? But it's basically a cherry can with a built-in um, water filter. It's rather expensive to buy, but it's it's really good because you can obviously can move it from the car and you can fill it up in the river. You can fill it up wherever there is water. Uh, and that also has, uh, we use that a lot. And once actually the, the cherry can broke and I contacted the support of Lifesaver and they just sent us a new cherry can with DHL Express to Belize City in the DHL office, so we could just pick it up there. Really, really good support. So I think this is a good oh, investment. That's pretty it's impressive. expensive, but yeah, it was that was really cool. I mean, that was that was good, good customer service. <laughs> all all I had to do was send them one email and picture of the of, of the uh, like the ID tag of the of the cherry can, and two weeks or a week later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they asked basically where do where should we send it to, and we were like, I guess we're in the city soon, so <laughs> send it there, please. Okay, that's great. And do you guys use solar or generator? Uh, yeah, we have a solar panel. Um, I have no idea what what the uh, nominal 
Wattage? Wattage. Wattage. Yeah. Wattage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is because I got it for free from a friend who bought it in Nepal after his panel broke. <laughs> okay. uh, but it works pretty well. We have this solar panel. I guess it's probably an 80 watt uh, panel. Uh, we have a second battery that charged that is charged from that panel, and we've got a fridge attached to it, and we charge our phones and, and tablet and, and laptop from it. Okay, and it tends to work pretty good for you. Yeah, the only time really was in the hottest time of of Central America, where we had to move on because we kind of ran out of power uh, after three days at the beach. Yeah, and we were parked more or less in the shade, so we couldn't, you know, we didn't get the full solar power uh, to charge our batteries. But uh, apart from that, it worked flawlessly on the whole trip so far. Okay, and what refrigerator do you guys use? Uh, we have an Engel refrigerator, which, by the way, broke in Ecuador, and but we got it fixed by a local refrigeration technician technician company basically yeah okay and what size is it uh it's a pretty small one 27 liters i think or 25 okay, so liters. it's pretty small and are you guys happy with that size or do you wish you had something a little bit bigger i think for the size of our vehicle i wouldn't okay. want bigger because yeah. of the amount of space it takes up yeah bigger would obviously be nicer but in this car i wouldn't go bigger than that Okay. Any specific recovery gear that you guys use or would recommend to our listeners to make sure that they've always got with them? We don't carry that much with us and we never actually use the things we carry with us for ourselves. Okay. <laughs> but what we what we do have is like this uh, sand aluminum sand letters um, mm-hmm. from a German company, which are really nice because they're really uh, stable. You can build small, you could even build a small like bridge well, not bridge, but, you know, to just go over a, a bigger gap and drive over it. We use that one, uh, but not for us, somebody else who got stuck. That's obviously made for when you're stuck in the, in the sand. Uh, what we also have is uh, an elastic rope, uh, which is really cool for in the sand. If somebody gets stuck, you don't really have to shovel a lot. You can just if you have good good points, recovery points, you can just attach them and basically drive into it. And because it's elastic, it has this gradual force build up, and it works amazingly well. I didn't use it on this trip. I used that in Tunisia a lot, and it's just the best thing to get the car out of the sand without much effort. And uh, we also have this, I don't even know the English word for that. <laughs> It's some kind of like a tiny rope that you attach to your car where you then put the big rope on. Usually these things are made out of metal, but the metal ones, they snap, and then you have like a bullet coming flying to wherever, and they're really dangerous. So the one, the, the soft ones, uh, we have that, and they use those on the trip as well. Okay, so it's a soft shackle. Yeah, right. And obviously a shovel for... <laughs> Digging holes when you need to go or when yeah, you need shovel to. Yeah, shovel comes in handy for a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't okay, cool. Yourself. So road stories are always a favorite. What's a favorite road story of yours or maybe a situation where you were nervous going into and how did it turn out for you? Oh, I think our off-road adventure in Ecuador. Um, <laughs> we followed Google Maps, which was a huge Uh-oh. mistake. Um <laughs> We started going downhill on this road, and it got a little sketchy, but Ben hopped out, did some recon. Okay, we're all right. And as we go, the road gets worse and worse. It's basically a motorbike track. It's not meant for four wheels. And I've never off-roaded like this with Ben, but he had me out there spotting to make sure we don't fall in holes. And we did fall in one of the holes And it nearly flipped us, but we were so deep on both sides, basically, (laughs) it caught us. Yeah, we basically leaned on the the wall on the other side. But, yeah, that was a good one. (laughs) Yeah, it kept going. Uh, Yeah, well, not many, though. I was supposed to take a video, but I got too freaked out about the car maybe flipping that. The video, I just dropped the phone and started, I don't know, panicking. (laughs) 
Yeah, we were busy <laughs> catching out of it. <laughs> it is your home, um, though. Yeah, it is, and it has my dog inside. I mean, she doesn't have a seatbelt on. Oh, poor Mitzi. I think it was a three kilometers, and it took us an hour to get through. Is that about right? Yeah, it was three kilometer stretch, and it took us, I think, ninety minutes to get through that. Um, but yeah. I mean, that's why we drive in an Land Rover, so we can do these these things. But this was pretty. This was really at the limit. I mean, I have to admit, I was pretty nervous there. Um. Yeah, when we almost. <laughs> almost flipped i was in the car at that point and i asked i could get out while we're sitting there sideways <laughs> i can't believe ben made it through that i would have just parked the car and walked down i'm like help <laughs> somebody help uh, it's a land rover you'll make it through yeah <laughs> so any helping others doing good or philanthropy that you focus on while you're overlanding or any ideas and tips you have for our listeners on things that they might get involved with um, we haven't done as much as I wish we would have. In Costa Rica, we volunteered for two weeks at an animal shelter or an animal rescue. Um, and that was really fun. We almost left with two more dogs. It was, a, it's a bit of a danger. Um, there was actually, oh, they were so sweet. They were all so sweet, but Mitzi did not like that. She was not a fan of us being there. Ooh, jealousy. Um, very jealous. Um, <laughs> We had actually planned to help out at a place in Lima through somebody we knew in Switzerland. Um, but then we ended up shooting through Lima and most of Peru to make it down to Patagonia. So we had communicated. And then when we were ready to say we're almost in Lima, we just ended up not going. It's just too bad. Yeah. Well, I also do as a volunteer, I would say, is uh, doing reviews of spots in iOverlander. So I basically moderate uh, new or existing entries there. And I do that pretty much every week uh, for a few hours. So all the new entries uh, that have been contributed by somebody will be reviewed by somebody in the, in the like volunteer team of iOverlander. Uh, you know, check things like is the is it a legal campground or is it like a legal, legal wild camp spot? Is it in the right category and all these all these things oh, that need to be okay. double checked? There's a whole list of um, requirements for new entries, and Ben just basically checks against those requirements. Okay. Like a wild camp in a national park is going to get deleted because mm. that is illegal, um, and they don't want to support any illegal camping. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Okay, cool. So this has been a lot of fun. Anything that we missed? No. And it's just starting to rain. So I think <laughs> it's good timing getting the, the raindrop sounds. Yeah. And we can lightly hear it in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Let's wrap it up with some fun facts about you. What keeps your co-driver occupied on long drives? Being the DJ, so I pick podcasts and music and try to navigate, sometimes less successful than other times. <laughs> Do you find that you use Google Maps less now? Uh, we, If there's a questionable road, we check it against Maps Me. There you go. Because that time, actually, Maps Me listed it as a bike track. And if we Ooh, had checked that. That would have been helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Richard would have felt a lot better about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and do you play any musical instruments on the road or around the campfire at night? No, unfortunately not. I once tried to learn how to play guitar and then I noticed again, damn, that's a lot of work. <laughs> 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 so, no. <laughs> and what's your favorite drink in the morning to get you going? Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> that. In sync. Did you hear that? Yes. Coffee. <laughs> What's a favorite beverage at night to wind down after a long day on the road? We're both beer drinkers. We're not too much wine drinkers or anything. And Patagonia, maybe why we like it. There's a lot of good uh, artisanal microbrews down here. It's really nice. Oh, nice. What's a favorite type of beer that you guys like? We're both IPA drink- drinkers. Yeah. I like hoppy beer. Yeah. Generally. Oh, I love it. Uh, what beer? Hoppy. Oh, hoppy. 
I yeah. thought he said like coffee, like a coffee flavor beer. Well, yeah, you can do that too, but hoppy is much better. Oh. Is there a different <laughs> flavor that they have? No, they hops. do have a really cool, well, I I, the IPA with, uh, what's the name? Calafate. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. a local IPA that's made with a local berry that's kind of like a blueberry-esque. So it has a little okay. bit of a light smell. Nice. All right. Yeah. We're going on a beer tour. Yeah. If you don't ask, you don't know. That's awesome. And then what is your best advice to aspiring overlanders like us? Um, I'd say don't overthink it. Yeah. Just just do it. Yeah. Get your stuff together and go and you'll figure it out on the road. All the things you worry in the beginning will probably not be an issue and the things you didn't think about it will come and haunt you. (laughs) So Rachel, were you ultimately a little hesitant or did Ben just pick you up and say, we're leaving? (laughs) I was very hesitant. Um, And he told me from the beginning when we met, this is his life goal. And I eh, hemmed and hawed and I don't know. Um, What really helped when we decided to make it happen is we made a uh, agreement on basically if I'm having a bad time, I was going to give it three months, no questions asked, was not going to quit. And if after three months I was miserable, then we do something else. But I'd say the first night, the first couple nights, I was a little miserable, but then by three months I loved it. And now I'm a year and a half in and still love it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there you go. So how can people learn more about you and what you guys are doing? Um, we keep our blog up to date, pretty well up to date. We're, we've blogged through Taurus del Pine. So we're up to two weeks ago. And that's where Ben posts all his awesome photography is within the blog. <laughs> okay, great. So where do we find that? What's the web address? It's granviaje.ch. Very good. And for our listeners, would you be kind enough to spell that for us? It's G-R-A-N-V-I-A-J-E dot C-H. That's big trip in Spanish. Yeah, very good. And any social media that people can follow you on? Yeah, Ben ha- Ben updates the Instagram. It's got the same, granviaje dot C-H. And then he also links to Mitzi's Instagram, which is <laughs> Mitzi Grams, Mitzi underscore Grams, if you just want pictures of the dog. <laughs> very good. Mitzi's got her own Instagram account. Passport, Instagram. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> Famous dog. Yeah. Any more information you'd like to give or useful resources that our listeners should check out? Um, I think we should use all the regular ones yeah, that like everyone else uses. Yeah. The Facebook groups, like the Pan American one, the Animal Traveler Facebook group. Mm-hmm. There's even a... Um, What's the kitchen group? The cooking group? Oh, yeah. There's now an Overland Kitchen group to exchange recipes and ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, I Overland or Wiki Overland. Yeah. And just all the the blogs and things you can find uh, about uh, the topics you like. Which- yeah. The, I think the bloggers that have helped us most with the dog, there's Paws on Tour. They went five years ago. And then Slow Car Fast House, um, until we passed them, they were a huge resource of vet recommendations and border crossings. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. We are humbled that you've given us such an amazing look into your world, experiences, and knowledge. Safe travels and adventures to you. And we hope to catch up with you again in the future. All right. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you very much for having us. I thought it was pretty interesting that Ben is a moderator for iOverlander. I also thought it was pretty cool that they actually go through and verify the data the people enter. So when you're looking at iOverlander, legit information, double checked. I can only imagine what Rachel was thinking when she was asked to grab the dog and get into a cop car. Oh, at the Honduras border, I think it was. Yeah. I, yeah, I, Hmm. I think I'd 
Mm, I don't know. That would be a tough one. Well, she might have felt safe because she had her little Mitzi with her. Well, you just go with your gut feel, I guess, and you know the area and how it feels with the people and if you feel safe. But um, whew, I don't know that I'd... Well, you know, if it was during one of those moments oh, of grand irritation with a couple traveling together, it may have been, hey, bringing her back is optional. She's a good <laughs> cook. You may want to keep her a while. <laughs> but you would miss me. If, if I was to get into a police car with my doggie. You're probably right. At least you're in a safe space. Yes. Cooking for the cops. <laughs> so a lot of great information from Ben and Rachel. Let us know what your favorite part was. Ben and Rachel, thank you so much for your time sharing your stories, your experiences with all of us. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. There was a lot of great resources mentioned throughout part one and two. So be sure to visit the show notes page on our website at ghtoverland.com slash podcasts. Select the Grand Dihata episode. You're, you're, you might be getting better <laughs> at that, Lisa. Send both of us to Spanish class. All the details and helpful links are already there for you. Sorry, Ben and Rachel. <laughs> We're trying. It almost came out ta-ta. <laughs> a big thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to help support the podcast, consider Patreon. And send your questions, suggestions, and feedback to ghtoverlandpodcast at gmail.com. If you have an Amazon Echo, remember to tell Alexa, play the GHT Overland podcast. We would love it if you would connect with us on the social medias at GHT Overland. Be sure to share this episode with your friends who enjoy travel off the beaten path. Overland travel is all about meeting new friends, seeing the most amazing places on earth, and of course, new food and new drinks. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean the world to us. If you did two things to help out, rate and review and subscribe to the GHT Overland Podcast. Giving the GHT Overland Podcast a little extra love on your podcast platform of choice. Thank you, and we will see you next Thursday for a brand new episode of the GHT Overland Podcast. Bye. Bye.